Hi, um, welcome to the uh, event automation training in the middle class, um, hosted by the Future Middle Class Initiative here at Brookings. Um, this is the third such event where we've sort of focused on, on having a conversation on various aspects related to middle class mobility and how automation affects job markets and the lives of the workers who might be affected. Um, today, we're going to have uh, three panel discussions on various aspects of this issue. Uh, the first one will uh, focus on the role of community colleges in both training the future middle class entrants potentially and also reskilling uh, potentially displaced workers um, after they've um, been displaced from their jobs. Uh, the second panel will focus uh, more on public private partnerships and how public policy can support um, reskilling of these potentially displaced workers. And the final panel, which will be moderated by my colleague Richard Reeves, uh, will focus on something a little more exigent that's affected all of us. It's the role of COVID-19 in affecting uh, jobs. Um, as some of the concerns that have been raised and when we look at our current high unemployment rate, um, are any of these jobs coming back? And it's possible that COVID-19 might accelerate ongoing processes to move towards automation and artificial intelligence. And so we wanna have a discussion on that. So um, before we get started, I just wanna thank uh, Sarah Zhao, uh, Hannah Van Dree, and Anna Dawson for putting this together for us. And I wanted to introduce our uh, first paper and our panelists. Our first paper will be presented by Riley Acton, who is a new associate, uh, assistant professor at Miami University. Um, and she will uh, be uh, joined after her talk on a panel by Scott Rawls, the president of Wake Tech Community College System in Wake, uh, Wake County, North Carolina, and Lauren Pellegrino, senior research associate at the Community College Research Project at Columbia University's Teachers College. Riley, if you want to take it away, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. I'm just going to uh, share my screen here. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'm excited to be here today to talk about uh, community college program choices in the wake of local job losses. Uh, just before I dive in, kind of usual disclaimer, this project uses data from uh, the state of Michigan, their Department of Education, so they've approved these results to share, but anything that I say today does not necessarily reflect the views um, of that agency or their employees. So hopefully um, this topic doesn't need a lot of motivation for the folks that are joining us today. I think we all come from a place of understanding that community colleges play a really large role in higher education in the United States, enrolling somewhere between 30 and 40% of college students, um, disproportionately low income students and students of color. And we also know that community colleges can play a really large role um, in terms of workforce development policy and in terms of developing the labor market in their local economies. Now, uh, one thing that we know as well, um, thanks to really the expansion of a lot of state data systems that link up education records with employment records, is that the returns to a community college education in terms of how students uh, fare in the labor market can really vary depending on what types of programs students complete. So uh, one of the examples that you see cited uh, quite a bit is that healthcare programs, uh, registered nursing, as well as other types of healthcare technician programs seem to prepare students really well for in-demand careers. Um, and this seems pretty consistent across different, different settings and different groups of students. But of course, not every program uh, necessarily has these same results. And in contrast to the four-year college sector, where there has been a lot of empirical work for a long time now on trying to understand how students decide what to major in, how students sort into different types of uh, fields of study, we really do not know quite as much at the community college level about how students choose what programs they would like to go into and how these choices in particular um, relate to the labor market. So in this paper, I study how students respond to negative economic events in their community, 
specifically focusing on how that affects their enrollment choice in community college, as well as what program they choose to pursue. And uh, now empirically what I do, I won't go into all the details here. I won't have any um, equations or, or Greek letters, but just as a broad overview of what, what's going on here is I'm going to be exploiting variation from mass layoffs and plant closings in the state of Michigan. These are different types of events that are reported um, to Michigan's WARN system. Um, WARN is one of my now favorite acronyms, the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act, which is a federal mandate that requires that if employers have mass layoffs or plant closings that meet certain criteria, they have to report those to their state labor market agency. So I have a listing of all mass layoffs and plant closings that were reported in Michigan over about the last 20 years. And then what I do that's um, new in this paper is I match those events to industries. So I can see General Motors, that's a very different industry than a hospital, as an example. And then I rely on the fact that different occupations are concentrated in different industries to estimate students' exposure to negative economic events um, in different occupations and therefore potentially affecting um, their preferences among different fields of study. So the intuition here is fairly straightforward. Um, if General Motors has a plant close or has a mass layoff, that's probably not going to be affecting healthcare professions very much. But if a hospital closes, that probably is going to be affecting uh, the healthcare field. And I look at these different types of events in six different fields of study, business, health, the skilled trades, STEM, law enforcement, and then a miscellaneous catch-all category. And I link these uh, labor market data up with uh, post-secondary enrollment data from the Michigan Department of Education in order to track how recent high school graduates respond to these events in terms of their post-secondary choices. Um, really what I'm asking here is are students less likely to enter particular types of programs when related jobs in their communities experience some sort of negative employment shock? And the other thing I'm going to be asking is that if this is the case, that students are less likely to go into healthcare programs when a local hospital closes, as an example, um, what do they do instead? Is this really deterring them from entering post-secondary education overall, or is it adjusting what programs they go into, or is it maybe even um, inducing them to attend four-year colleges instead? What are the substitution patterns that are happening here? And as an overview of my results, I find um, that yes, indeed, students are less likely to enter particular programs when related occupations have experienced job losses in their communities. Students are most responsive to those layoffs, those job losses that occur in their senior year in the county in which they reside during high school. So it does seem like there's a certain amount of um, salience that is important in determining how students respond to the economy around them. They are not particularly responsive um, to layoffs that occur in their sophomore or junior years of high school or to those that occur a few counties away, um, suggesting perhaps that there's a need for more information or more guidance um, for these students as they're making choices. And in terms of the magnitude of these results, um, on average, I find that one additional layoff per 10,000 adults in a county reduces enrollment in related programs the following year by a little under 1%. Um, that is a fairly small uh, estimate in terms of the magnitude. Perhaps an easier way to think about it is kind of what happens if there's a larger event. So I find that a one standard deviation increase in layoff exposure during the senior year of high school reduces enrollment in related programs the following year by closer to about 4%. Now, I do not find... Um, much effect on overall enrollment in these career and technical type programs of students coming out of high school, suggesting that students are shifting their enrollment between different fields of study. They're not foregoing going to college or particularly going into the community college sector overall, but they are changing what types of programs they enter. And uh, in the second half of the paper, I look at this explicitly by estimating how job losses in each of the different groups of occupations that I'm studying affect enrollment in each of the corresponding um, program groups. So thinking about how do layoffs in healthcare occupations affect enrollment in uh, law enforcement programs, as an example. And I find um, some substitution effects here. And what I really dig into is how student substitution between different types of programs 
lines up with uh, the skills and the characteristics of the occupations that students might be uh, training to enter if they were to go into these different types of programs. And I'm able to do this um, by using different measures of occupational skills from the Department of Labor's ONET database, which I think uh, many on this call would probably be familiar with, but provides a wealth of information about the characteristics of different occupations. So essentially what I do is I create measures of how similar skills are between different occupations and therefore between different types of programs at the community college level. And I find some suggestive evidence that students are more likely to substitute towards programs um, whose occupations require similar skills. So it does not seem to be the case that students are exposed to some sort of negative employment shock in one field and decide they're gonna do a total 180 and go into something else. They seem to shift between things and look at least on paper somewhat similar. Uh, so one of the examples of those, those results uh, that I find is that when there is an increase in job losses in the healthcare field, um, you see fewer students going into healthcare programs, but you see an increase in enrollment in other social service programs, um, particularly childcare as one example. Now, in terms of the policy implications from these results, I think there's a couple different uh, kind of broad takeaways and, and directions to go. One um, that I hope is informative to people actually on the ground at community colleges is that colleges should be prepared for students' choices of programs to potentially change when the local economy is changing. And I think there's lots of different ways you could think about um, colleges helping students when these sorts of negative economic events occur around them. Um, Perhaps you invest more in additional counseling and advising for students who previously thought they were going to go into one field and are now changing their minds and wanting to go into something else. I think one um, potentially really important avenue is to help colleges be able to develop programs that fit their local economy as their local economy changes over time. Um, of course, we are all facing uh, budget constraints right now that might make that difficult, but I think that's a potentially um, useful area to be thinking about future policy. And um, of course, another thing related to that is having colleges um, in partnership with local employers trying to have um, real time information about what local employers are needing in terms of uh, occupations and skills for students to develop. At an even larger level, um, going beyond the community college sector, just to think about education choices as a whole, I think um, high schools, colleges, communities, etc. Um, should continue to think about what sorts of information students have about the labor market um, and what sorts of information they then provide on top of uh, maybe what students already know. So what is the relevant labor market for students in terms of geography, I think is something we don't have a great grasp on and how does that vary um, across different demographic groups of students. One thing that I find in my paper is that students are really sensitive to what's happening right around them. Um, and that could suggest some sort of lack of information about a broader context that maybe high school guidance counselors um, or folks at the community colleges could be helpful um, in providing information to students. But it could also be that students are really acting um, quite reasonably if they have geographic constraints or preferences that are really keeping them in a local area. Um, so trying to determine what, what students' geography um, preferences and constraints are and fitting information uh, to those I think could be potentially important as well. So to wrap up here, um, just again, overall findings, uh, local labor market shocks appear to deter students from enrolling in closely related community college programs. This is not um, because students no longer attend college. If anything, we know that when local economies worsen, we see increases in college enrollment, but we do see a shifting of students into other types of programs particularly those that seem um, similar across some skill dimensions. Now, um, one limitation of these results, it's really a limitation driven by the data that I have access to right now, is that I am only considering the choices of students coming right out of high school and enrolling in college for the first time. Um, of course, I think it is very important to study the choices of students further out of high school, older adults, um, particularly in current moments where, that we are in, if we are expecting an increase in older students enrolling in higher education and community colleges. Um, particularly, I think thinking about um, how do displaced workers decide to re-enroll or enroll for the first time in higher education and how do the skills that they've developed in their career thus far translate into the types of programs they enter is 
um, a really important question and an important line of future research. And of course, as I think we will have um, some of our panelists discuss later, thinking about how something as broad as the current moment we are in, in terms of the COVID pandemic and ensuing economic downturn, how is this going to affect the types of fields, um, the fields of study students might want to enter, and how that varies across um, age and demographics is, of course, something we'll be following, I think, for quite some time. So I will wrap up there and turn it over to uh, Lauren and Scott. Thank you, Riley, for that. Um, Scott and Lauren, um, we would be interested in hearing your remarks. Um, Scott? Appreciate this. Uh, well, Riley's paper kind of harkened me back to some conversations or memories from almost 20 years ago with an interaction with a major employer. I've been a community college president at three uh, local community colleges, as well as the North Carolina Community College System. This goes back almost 20 years ago when I was uh, president of a smaller college that uh, we were having conversations with an employer who was a manufacturer of a, a luxury item and had really cyclical demand in that regard and responded through its employment, whereby you know, within a matter of every three or four years, it seemed like they were very much ramping up employment and then ramping back down and ramping back up and ramping back down. And the conversations we were having were, why could they not get students into the short-term training programs that, that they needed for that? Why would the college not you know, reenact a, a, a specific degree? Uh, and the challenge was that you know, it, students, and actually I think there is communities have memories for these things. There's a community awareness. So you know, sometimes it's not as, uh, it's based on just conversational. It's not so much based on data. But whenever there is a significant employment event, it creates a lingering me memory, particularly in communities that are smaller in that regard. And that's something that we saw. So students, we, you know, while students were looking for jobs, they had a, there was a lingering sense of, well, are those jobs stable? Are they going to be there? Uh, and so that was a challenge. And we've seen that in uh, many cases in community college. So I think that rings true with Riley's uh, paper. One thing I would say real quickly about, you know, looking at community colleges and, and looking as we move forward, I often say that community colleges are through colleges, we're not to colleges. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you take the college where I am now, Wake Tech, um, if I went out and surveyed middle school students throughout Wake County and Raleigh right now, probably very few as a percentage would say, I'm going to Wake Tech someday. They have other aspirations. But at the end of the day, 25% of all the graduates in our county come to us. Um, but they come through us primarily not to come to us, but to either go first step to a university for many of those students or to go into our applied programs or as Riley's paper notes or vocational programs. And as she was talking about those areas, one of the things, um, if you look at the students who go into what, it, what she was referring to as vocational community college programs, what we might call applied associate or certificate type programs, those students, um, as was noted in Michigan, you know, they are more likely to be lower socioeconomic, more likely to be male, I think that you noted. But I've also found that the age differences are quite different between students who are pursuing what we might call university transfer degrees, and those are pursuing more skill-based degrees. In fact, here at Wake Tech today, there's a five-year difference in the average age. The average age for our applied vocational degrees is 28. The average age for our university transfer is 23. I think there's also a difference in focus with students in that regard. Students who are younger, high school students, uh, typically find that perhaps their focus is a little more lifetime career. They often think about what's the degree path. Uh, sometimes they will not limit themselves to what might be a terminal two-year degree. Uh, adults, which are more likely the students who percentage-wise typically will go into our applied degrees, they're very skill focused because they're often thinking about not so much what's their lifetime career, but what's their lifeboat job. They're looking for that next thing. They're thinking very much in that regard. So I think that while I know Raleigh's paper could only look at seniors in high school, I bet if you applied it to all our applied students, our skill-focused students in that regard, you would probably even find a greater uh, impact by, by the, the types of impacts of, of plant closings or job loss in that regard, because they're tuned to that more so, I think, than the younger students in that regard. Uh, one thing I just would comment on real quickly before um, turning over to Lauren is I think that something that we'll see coming out of this recession, I, I think back to the last big economic event, I, I 
used to joke and say I became president of the North Carolina Community College System on the day the Great Recession started in 2008. And uh, within a matter of uh, three years, our enrollment had grown by 28%. I mean, we're likely to see students just pouring into us as a result of this economic impact. As we moved into this, though, there was a lot of conversation that you often hear about skills versus degrees. Um, in the, you know, we've now moved within three months from one of the best job markets ever, or, or, or toughest job markets if you're an employer, to now what is you know completely different scenario within three months. Heading into this event, which we're still very much in the early stages, I think, of the economic impact, you know, there was a lot of talk about skills versus degrees. Uh, I had lots of employers who would say to me, we don't care about degrees, we only care about skills. Um, but I would often find that sometimes that conversation was coming more from CEOs, executives, production managers. When you talk to human resources folks, they still cared about degrees. Um, and so sometimes you'll see this dichotomy between skills versus degrees. I think as we come out of the pandemic, that's even going to be ramped up a little bit because like we saw in the Great Recession, you're going to see more people with advanced degrees pursuing jobs that you wouldn't need typically that type of degree for, competing some more with students who are coming out of certificate certifications or other programs. And I think though all students are going to need more skill to get that first job. So I think there is this dichotomy, false dichotomy that sometimes set up between skills versus degrees. And I think in the degrees that we're talking about with Riley, one of the things that we need to be aware of is how do we create progression? Because that first job often requires skill. And that may be a certificate that comes into an associate degree. And can then we transfer to a bachelor's degree from that? That's a more difficult thing, but that's something that we have to think about. I think that's also why coming out of the last recession, you saw a growth in community college bachelor degrees because of this issue. So I think that's a dynamic we need to pay attention to as we look at this. And I think that, um, you know, certainly the impacts of this recession are going to, we're still just now seeing the early aspects. So we see a lot of healthcare decline right now, but I think you'll see that be right back up over time when we see more construction and manufacturing as consumer demand. So we a lot to be seen in terms of what uh, what's going to happen, but I predict that just like in the last or last recession, the road to recovery in the United States is going to run right through the middle of America's community colleges. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Lauren, um, your comments, please. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I, I just want to underscore some of the things that, that uh, Dr. Rawls talked about. I think, uh, you know, CCRC, Community College Research Center, has been uh, has partnered with MIT, and we're in the a year now into a a project called Emerging Technologies in the Future of Work. And what we've done is we've gone out and we've talked to community colleges across the country about how they are thinking about these issues, this emerging sort of new era, but also, um, you know, what are, what are the things that they're doing? And what we learned um, is that these institutions are, are heavily involved in their communities and their regions and with employers. And I don't just mean keeping an ear to the ground or getting some out, outdated labor market data. They're, they're having meetings, they're convening employers on campus, they're talking with them on a daily basis, they're making curricular changes based on recommendations from employers. So they're really, really in tune with what's happening with the employment landscape in their communities and it's a it's a major effort it's a big lift it's everyone from the president i know dr rawls is always um often uh, you know deal, working with employers on a daily basis all the way to faculty uh and beyond so you know the institutions are, are heavily committed to understanding and being responsive to the changes in their labor market um but again that's that's a very resource intensive effort and uh and you know we've been really impressed to see the extent to which these institutions are on a daily basis out working with employers to try and be responsive, adding programs, talking about credentials, talking about skills, holding their feet to the fire when they talk about things like we don't care about, you know, credentials, we just care about skills and then, you know, calling them out when they actually do care about credentials, things like that. Um, so making sure that, you know, uh, that there's accountability. Also, these colleges are, are creating these pipelines for students to engage with employers while they're students so that, you know, so that they can start to develop those relationships, uh, develop the skills that employers are claiming that they're having a hard time finding, um, including, you know, technical, but also non-technical skills. So, uh, so there's just a really strong working relationship between community colleges and their local labor market. And, and we were certainly very impressed with that. Um, the other thing that kind of comes to mind, uh, and, and Riley, to your point, to your suggestion, I think is really good, is that 
you know, what institutions are doing, and we're learning this both through future of work, but also through some of our guided pathways and student services work, is that colleges are reaching out to students very, very early. So, uh, you know, as soon as they apply, they're getting a phone call within, an, you know, two days from somebody at the institution to talk with them about, you know, their program choice, about what their career options are. Um, because you're right, uh, Dr. Rawls, to your point, younger students sometimes don't tend to, they might not know what all the career options are associated with a certain program. A returning adult might have a better idea of that, but they may need more support on things like you know, becoming a student again after many years of not being a student. Um, so, you know, so there's a lot of really early counseling that, that colleges are doing through onboarding, um, even high school outreach. There's a ton of high school outreach that community colleges do as well to try to make sure that, you know, for those students, those seniors who might be experiencing some disruptions in the labor market are seeing that, um, that they can help interpret that and help them con connect that to their next move. So, um, the other thing too is, is lastly, um, is that, uh, you know, I have done a little bit of qualitative work in terms of talking with students about their major choice. And, you know, it's, there's so many things that go into those decisions. A lot of it is, is um, you know, it, peers and family are highly influential uh, for students uh, in terms of how they choose some, their major. Um, and then to your point, Riley, as well as that sometimes it's something they want to do. They want to be in a helping profession. Uh, you know, they want to be, they want to be in a people facing profession, whatever that might be. And so trying to help them sort through, you know, because community colleges often have over a hundred programs to choose from. It can get very overwhelming. You know, you think about sort of the, the tyranny of choice, right? And how that's stressful that can be. So, uh, so there's a lot of effort on the part of colleges to really help students sort through that, make, help them make decisions with as much information as they possibly can. Um, so, and then just lastly on the, on the kind of the COVID note, I, I do wanna say that, you know, community colleges are excellent at crisis management. Uh, they have been doing this for a very long time. They do it during recessions. They've been managing crisis of poverty in their communities for a very long time. So uh, I think uh, just to underscore what Dr. Rawls said earlier is I think if there's an, any entity that is poised to help support communities getting back on their feet after this, it's community colleges. So thank you so much, Dr. Acton, for your, for your work on this and for spotlighting community colleges. We're always happy to see that. <laughs> I'm tr having trouble unmuting. Um, thank to b b both of you for those comments. Um, it's in, it's a, it, this is a really interesting topic and one that as you know, a university professor, I should be much more attuned to and I haven't been to this point. So I, you guys have really put this on my, uh, in front of my face as something to think about. Um, so um, for the audience and everyone here, we're going to begin the moderated uh, question part of this. So if you have any questions, please submit them um, and, uh, and I'll get them. Um, I wanted to begin with my own questions uh, um, for all three of you. And the, the first uh, question that I'll pose to, to all three and each of you can give you a response to this is, in what ways do you think that public policy, whether at the national level or at the state and local level, can actually help sort of foster some of this flexibility to respond to these, these, these local shocks. Because, I mean, what's clear from Riley's paper is that, and from um, both Scott and Lauren's um, discussion is that people are paying attention and people are responding to this information. So in what ways can, can uh, public policy actually support this flexibility to be able to provide the programs that these uh, students need to to adjust both, you know, new entrance into school just out of high school, but also thinking about potentially displaced workers. Um, Riley, you can begin. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing that comes to mind um, for me is funding, right? So in order to be flexible and in order to develop new programs, it, it takes substantial resources to be able to do that. And if you're particularly trying to do that quickly and as kind of Lauren mentioned in a crisis situation that's probably going to take even more resources um, and of course this is hard right because at the same time when economic shocks are happening that's also when you have state and local um, budgets getting really tight um, but trying to figure out ways to reallocate funding towards uh, developing new programs or enhancing programs that already exist um, something that kind of is triggered by some sort of local economic event seems like the ideal thing that we would be able to have. 
Um, yeah, I don't know if Lord and Scott have anything uh, to add on that. Well, I'll just, uh, I'll double down on, on what she just said. And I know sometimes it's just assumed that someone would say funding, but I think it's something that we really have to talk about in this regard. You know, high, high demand careers, programs that train and educate students for high demand careers are often high cost. You know, the instructors are instructors who can demand more on the market. Uh, the equipment is often very expensive. And oftentimes the class sizes are limited because you're working around a very expensive piece of equipment. You have a nursing program where you may have a, you know, limitations on a clinical size. They're very expensive for colleges like us to offer, but they're also the ones that will lead to the best jobs. I also believe that, you know, and I've said this many times before, but I, I still believe this very much is that the greatest um, difference in rhetoric to investment is truly technical education. I mean, everybody's in favor of it. Everybody talks about how important it is. Check out where the investments go. Are they really going to technical education? So I think understand the cost, understand the impact and the opportunity, but also look to see where the investment's going. And typically there's a lot of rhetoric, but there's not that much investment. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I won't, I won't, uh beat the funding horse because I think that's a very true, um, very true. I think the other thing too is that, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the challenges that we saw that colleges had in our, in our work is that, you know, to be responsive, right, to, to employer changes and needs, there's a whole lot of hoops that you have to jump through in order to do that, right? You have accreditors, um, you might have to get something approved at the state level so that it can be offered across the state, like, you know, new programs. So you, you want to open, uh, offer a new program at an institution. You may have to get that approved at the state level because in theory that has to be offered at all the institutions. Um, and those, I mean, we hear sometimes that that can take years. So, you know, and communities don't have years, students don't have years, colleges don't have years. So a way to, to, to remove the barriers, the red tape and enable colleges to get high quality programs up and running um, quickly and, you know, and in conjunction with their employers and also facilitating ways for colleges to engage very early on with potentially new employers in their community or, or major evolutions that are taking place in those, in those, uh, in those areas, so. Yeah, I think to me, it seems important that, um, and this was gonna be sort of the follow-up question I had to this discussion about funding, is how do you foster these public-private partnerships to ensure that the programs that you guys are bringing forward um, both respond to student needs, but also employer needs as well? Because uh, students often, you know, there are a lot of information sources, as, as Riley's pointed out, that they can get both local and outside of their local area, but given that many of the students are at least initially geographically constrained, um, there's, there's gotta be ways in which um, uh, we could foster some public private partnerships to ensure that hidden gyms, places where there are vacancies and not necessarily clear to, to the students are being highlighted too when students are coming to the community colleges to, to, to receive that training. Could you comment on that um, either Scott or Lauren? Well, I think, uh, I think those partnerships are key to who we are, uh, primarily because our goal really, is, as I said, with through colleges is to help students achieve their aspirations. And for so many of our students, their aspiration is an economic aspiration. It's a, to better themselves and their family. So while we do workforce development, while we do employment, employer partnerships, it's about helping meet those goals for our students in that regard. It also then derives how they define our programs. And so, you know, and that, that also you can see the difference in the types of programs that Riley was discussing. The, you know, the, the what she called the vocational programs. I, I kind of stay away from that word because that's a, a word that our students would run. If we call something vocational, they will not sign up for it. You know, so we have to look for certain words. But, um, you know, those kind of applied skill-based programs are very skill-based. You know, they may have, in our case, 15 hours of general education credit, but the rest are skills that are defined by our employers. And then the challenge for those students, though, is they typically don't transfer beyond us. So we have to look out, you know, what's one of the things we do a lot is we spend a lot of time scoping out strategic partners where our students can transfer because it's the skills that get them the job. It's those technical skills, but a lot of times to be a supervisor in their role, they have to go beyond us and get a bachelor's degree. I don't know that they necessarily need that to be a supervisor, but when you look at the job postings, they often require that. And so that's why, you know, we have to pay attention to this mix of skills and degrees in that regard. 
Yeah, and I'll just briefly add, I think, um, you know, like I said, one of the things we're seeing colleges really see to try to scale up are these work-based learning opportunities for students. And that's part of that partnership, right, is, is connecting students with, with opportunities to do internships, to do co-ops, apprenticeships, um, you know, various job shadowing even um, to try and get students engaging with employers. And that creates that, that helps foster and, and solidify those partnerships as well to have students you know, engaging, engaging with those, with those uh, organizations. So, um, I, I'm sorry. I was, just, I was going to follow up on something, Lauren, with that, because I think that's one of the things I really worry about coming out of this economic crisis is one of the things we're already starting to see is companies retract, you know, their work-based learning opportunities for our students are going away. And for our students coming from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, typically um, those opportunities, in many cases are ways for them to get around the typical hiring process. Um, the, the ability to have that opportunity in college uh, to, to be able to earn money to do that. I mean, they, they can't do free internships because of who they are. And so I do worry coming out the other side that, that work-based learning is so important to community college students, but it is going to be the real challenge moving forward uh, because of the economic crisis. So that's something I worry a great deal about. So do I. And I just want to quickly say, add that the other benefit to work-based learning is that, believe it or not, there are still, you know, CEOs and, and organizations out there who don't think of a two-year college as really a, 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 a place where they want to get graduates, where they want to have employees come from. And by connecting students directly, they can see firsthand how talented and skilled um, these students are and, and the really, really high quality education they're receiving. So it's unfortunate. So that kind of gets scaled back. Yeah, that's unfortunate because, you know, we want to focus on skills, not necessarily uh, credentials. Um, Riley, a question came in from the audience just asking about your analysis, which um, they're asking, um, did, did you actually do an analysis of which subfields? Did you find the, the biggest demand supply gap, um, for example, uh, that you know, there are a lot of information technology jobs perhaps that are going unfilled and that people aren't necessarily uh, responding to them um, or maybe even more so. Um, did you investigate any of that sort of analysis? In this project, uh, you know, explicitly try to calculate gaps in uh, demand and supply. Um, I have done a little bit of work trying to break up the categories that I have I'm currently in the paper into kind of more more detailed, finer categories. Um, it gets a little tricky with the, the labor market data that I'm using because I just have um, the name of a firm. And from that, I'm inferring the industry and the industry inferring the types of jobs that it's affecting. Um, so it does get a little bit tricky. Um, I think I, in that question, they were asking about the IT sector in particular, um, and that's actually one area that makes up the majority of the STEM category in my analysis, which is a little different. Um, a lot of times when I present this paper, I try to point out like that what we think of as STEM at the four-year college level and what we think of as, as STEM at the two-year college level can differ um, a little bit in terms of what programs are there. Um, and STEM is actually an area where I don't see um, much effects of local labor market shocks on students' choices, which could suggest that there's some sort of heterogeneity in terms of, you know, maybe particular types of jobs are, are being affected, but other ones are still um, in high demand, or students are just um, able to interpret those as kind of temporary shocks in the labor market rather than longer run trends, because I think a lot of us um, no matter kind of how much you're, you're looking at labor market data, think, oh, technology is, is something that's continuing to be a big part um, of, of work in this day and age. Okay, thank you. Um, did you, um, Lauren or Scott, do you have any comments to add on sort of information technology or other subfields where you see the biggest uh, demand or a lack of demand uh, relative to what's, uh, what employers are demanding? I'll actually let uh, Scott directly answer that, but I did just want to jump in quickly going back to the policy conversation earlier is to, to just to add on to what Riley was just saying, labor market data is, is has been just really an elusive thing for institutions to, to get uh, and to find reliable to make decisions. I mean, it's another reason why they have to hit the streets literally to go talk with people and get that information because it's so difficult. It's hard for them to keep track of graduates. They don't have the internal resources to be able to do those things. So, um, you know, so anything that could help make that data uh, easier to, to get a hold of, I think would be beneficial. 
And just echoing that, I'd say we do have a new tool in our toolkit, I think, you know, with big data now, and that is the ability to really scrub job postings um, since they're all online. And so we, you know, in the past, we would have been dependent on labor market information that has a time lag and would sometimes won't capture this information. Now we can very much within the last three months tell what's happened, you know, in terms of job postings and what that means in a very current basis. And I think, I think we can all do a better job on the front end of, of relaying that information to our students. We found at a college where I was previously that uh, when students have that information, it really does um, influence their choice of major. Um, and so I do think there's a better job for us to do in all of that. I think also when we look at, you know, the issues about job layoffs in that regard, I think probably they have, you know, more impact in smaller areas than they do metropolitan areas because it gets sort of washed out a little bit in a metropolitan area. I think also in some areas, um, you know, the, the way the WARN notification works is that, you know, if you're a big manufacturer and you're going to close, you're going to have to give a WARN notification. If you're a business or others, then you can kind of get around that, you know, in terms of what that means. So, you know, I think it, I think big layoffs, we saw a lot of impact of that from manufacturing losses previously, but then those layoffs sort of factor in because now, even in North Carolina, where manufacturing is now, biotechnology process manufacturing, very advanced types of manufacturing, there's still a hangover effect of textile jobs and other types of jobs that were, you know, it's almost like a completely different thing, even though it's a diff uh, the same sector. So, you know, it's, there are lingering effects to what happens in terms of layoffs in, in that regard in, in different parts of the country. Okay, great. This is a great discussion. Um, so we're going to move to our next panel. I want to thank uh, Riley Acton again for uh, presenting that interesting paper and, and Scott Rawls and uh, Lauren Pellegrino's uh, interesting comments on this issue. We're going to move next to our, um, our panel, um, which is going to be focused on assessing the actual state-based policy to support uh, retraining of workers. Um, we'll have Annalise Golger, who's a, a David M. Rubenstein fellow here at Brookings and Metro. Um, and she'll be presenting her paper on uh, evaluating a policy in California. And then as a part of our pan panel, we'll have uh, Melanie Zaber, who's an associate economist at Rand and a specialist in workforce development, as well as uh, Joel Branch, who's uh, currently vice president of AI development at, uh, is it looped? <laughs> looped? <laughs> um, a uh, art of, what'd you say? Lucid. Yeah. Oh, I apologize, I apologize yeah. for this presentation. Okay. Um, um, which is a, a an actual uh, company that's focused on developing AI uh, that complements uh, humans, human workers. So, um, um, Let's begin, um, Annalise, or uh, um, her co-author, Marion Nogocha. Um, I don't know which one of you is planning to present, but uh, you guys can take it away. And then we'll have a panel and moderate questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. And it's a real pleasure uh, to be on this panel and a great conversation. Um, so before I came to Brookings for the Rubenstein Fellowship, I worked at Social Policy Research Associates. And so what we're gonna to present today is from a project that I led there um, with the California Entra uh, Employment Training Panel. And uh, Dr. Marianne Nagoita was uh, one of my colleagues that worked closely with me on this project, um, which was a mixed method study. Um, so the California Employment Training Panel is a state, um, program that reimburses employers for training their workers. Um, it was created in the 80s as a response to the globalization pressures as a, as a strategy for retaining jobs in the state and retaining competitiveness of the companies that were in California. Um, and every, every so often there's a piece in legislation that says they should evaluate the program um, to see how it could be updated and improved. And so that's why we did this assessment through uh, Social Policy Research um, Associates. Um, so I'm going to hand it off now to Dr. Nagoita to uh, kind of start the presentation. Okay. 
think he's on mute though, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, um, sorry, I, I wasn't able to unmute for some reason. Um, hi, everyone, I'm happy to be here. Um, and so uh, just briefly, what is the, uh, the, the case for public funding in uh, worker retraining? Um, so the, the easy answer, the simple answer is that um, there appear to be market failures in this area because employers have been complaining for many years that they do not find typically or sometimes find the, uh, the, the, the kinds of people with the kinds of skills that they need. Um, on the other hand, you have individual workers who would like to, uh, to retrain, but uh, sometimes it's costly and they cannot afford it. And some other times it's really hard to know um, what are the options that they have. There's too many options, they cannot really decide. Um, also, we know from the literature that um, employers typically underinvest in training uh, because they are afraid that uh, the employees may be uh, getting poached by other companies or because high turnover or a combination of these things. Um, and so that is really in a nutshell why you know, public spending, it's a typical case of public spending is needed where, there, where, where there's a market failure. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Annalise to talk about the methodology. So very briefly, th this was a multi-component study that was mixed method. We had interviews with stakeholders, employers, staff, and we had we gathered program data and analyzed it. We also developed and deployed an, an employer survey and received about 600 responses. Those are employers that um, participated in ETP. And then um, what we're gonna focus on most though is the impact study where we compared employers that got the ETP funding for training with those who were similar, had similar characteristics, um, who did not receive the funding. Um, so the key findings that we had, um, sorry, I'm, I guess people aren't able to see the presentation. <laughs> Here, let me try screen sharing again. <laughs> Um, oops. It's hard to do a screen share with multiple presenters, I'm learning. <laughs> uh, so uh, the key findings um, that we had, um, one is just how employers talked about the benefits of this program. So one of the things that many employers said is that the funding helped them formalize internal career advancement structures and um, learning management systems that before were a little bit more haphazard. Um, so it helped to kind of ingrain more of a culture of learning. Um, we also heard a lot about how the access to the funding was cumbersome and administratively challenging. Um, and so to the extent that many employers hired consultants that were expert in the rules and the process to figure out how to access the funds without spending quite a lot of time getting through the process, um, which can also become a barrier to entry, which we'll talk a little bit about later when it comes to very small firms. Um, although I, I should say that many of them noted that it's getting a little bit better in recent years. Um, the needs that they talked about the most varied uh, by sector and, and by type of employer, small, medium, large, but there were some general themes. There were a lot of employers that were using the funds to pay for new and new technologies. So for high tech, that could mean keeping your workforce skills fresh, um, like cloud, migrating to cloud technology, for example. But for even people like janitors um, that are entry level positions, a lot of those roles are, are starting to integrate technology in new ways and some basic digital literacy training was, was needed at those types of organizations. And then um, a lot of people with the baby boomers retiring, they're seeing a lot of need for applied managerial and supervisory skills um, throughout a lot of the companies that we interviewed. So um, I think that's important uh, to note and it kind of connects back to what can the community colleges uh, do that, that, that employers need, it's applied. Um, and then um, we heard differences in how this different size companies talk about the type of help that's needed. Um, so what we found was that a lot of the small and mid-sized employers, um, because they were, we were growing fast and they're trying to create these new learning systems for the first time, a lot of times they didn't know which training providers to reach out to, who, who gives a good quality lean management training. What, what should we look like 
look at to evaluate the effectiveness of that training for our needs in this sector. And so those are the things that um, ETP could consider in the future in terms of um, you know, what could they do that's a value add for, for those types of businesses. Um, so now I'm gonna pass it back. <laughs> Hopefully the, this presentation will stay um, back to Marianne to talk about the impact study. <laughs> Yes, so uh, we also conducted a quasi-experimental um, impact study based on propensity score matching. So basically we just compared uh, ETP funded companies with non-ETP comp uh, funded companies that were very similar. Um, I'm not gonna go into technical details. Uh, we can maybe save that for uh, Q&A, the Q&A piece of it. Um, but the, the big picture, as you can see in the, in the slide is positive. We found positive impacts on both employment and revenue or sales for ETP uh, funded companies. Um, it sort of varied, as you can see in the whiskers, uh, the, the accuracy of the estimate varied. Um, some were more precisely estimated and some less. But overall, I think uh, all of these were statistically uh, positive, significant positive impacts. And they suggest that um, you know, ETP funding might have contributed to uh, increased labor productivity and um, increased competitiveness as a, as a result, which both would be expected to uh, increase size and, and revenue. And then beyond that, we sort of looked into a couple of um, sort of types of companies to see where the impact is really coming from. And we did multiple things, but for, for now we can only concentrate on company size. So as you can see here, uh, we basically found that uh, small and medium companies, uh, basically between 19 and 100 employees, appear to benefit the most uh, from this kind of um, uh, funding. Um, larger companies, there's a small uh, that but insignificant insignificance uh, impact on them. Um, for very small companies, uh, there appears to be a negative effect um, um, on employment. Uh, that's significant and we can talk about the implications of that um, a bit later on, uh, but, but roughly these were um, um, the, the basic findings which kind of suggest that small and medium companies tend to benefit the most. Annalise? Yes, and uh, briefly policy implications which uh, I will share with Annalise. I will start by saying that the, the findings suggest pretty Suggest, you know, strongly that uh, there's potential for, for an ETP kind of program uh, in terms of stimulating, stimulating economic development and entrepreneurship, um, you know, job creation and preservation. Uh, there's also this issue of staying on top of technology and investing in training appears to be a, a, you know, a promising way to deal with that and, and stay competitive. Um, we also are finding in the times of the pandemic that um, you know once your small and medium companies disappear from your neighborhood, you kind of tend to notice and not in a good way. And so anything that makes um, you know for a more vibrant local economy um, seems to be like a really good thing to to have. Um, there's a bit more discussion that tends tin that will need to happen into the needs of very small companies. Um, you know, what's happening there? Are there particular ways that they can be served in, in a way that helps them? Because they uh, appear to have very specific needs, you know, back to Annalisa's point of, you know, thinking about user needs and so forth. But um, yeah, uh, overall, these were like on sort of my side, uh, the, the big uh, sort of takeaways and Annalise has a couple to share too. Mm -hmm. Sure, so kind of backing out a, a little bit higher level here from the study, um, you know, a lot of us has been witnessing over the last two, three weeks um, after the killing of George Floyd, uh, uh, a need to focus more on diversity and inclusion in the workplace, um, in society as a whole, but also in the workplace. And so you have major companies coming out saying they're committed to anti-racism. Um, I think employers can play a major role in, in creating internal learning uh, structures for people to, to start in one position and move up to a higher level is part of that picture of how to bring build in more equity, um, including racial equity into companies. Uh, and so I think that this should be th thought through as a state strategy to incentivize more companies to engage in that, um, in those building stronger internal learning infrastructure. Um, the second point, uh, kind of referring back to the previous uh, panel, you know, 
we used Dun & Bradstreet data, which was very expensive to come by, frankly. And, um, and you know, you have to ask, like, why don't we have uh, more complete, uh, accessible public data sources where we can actually analyze the effects of these investments on firms, like firm level, uh, site level data, where we can see what's happening uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, which companies are growing and may need more help with training, which companies are at risk of a layoff. Um, can we develop more, um, more like data intelligence uh, using some uh, newer data sources? Uh, and then um, the final point is, um, I think gets back to the question people raised in the last panel around, around partnership, right? So a lot of uh, the program as it's currently structured focuses a lot on compliance and you know, reporting, making sure that the employer um, is, is uh, reporting the hours every week in a hard copy form in a certain form, right? It's, it's very compliance driven in its mindset. But what we're hearing from the, the you know, there, there's this kind of priority of anti-fraud and making sure bad actors aren't getting money from the public. But we also have to think about the priority of making sure that we're, um, you know, the public money is being used in a way that's most helpful to the people that are trying to use it um, to encourage more employers to partner uh, with community colleges, with workforce boards. Um, you know, to what extent can we design these where you have balancing both priorities instead of just overemphasizing sort of the policing um, role that the state can play. Um, so that I'll leave it at that and, and welcome some questions. Okay, thanks. Um, so first, before we get to the question and answer portion, um, I wanted to allow our panelists, uh, Melanie Zaber and Joel Branch to uh, give their thoughts on, you know, various aspects of the public private partnership piece that's being evaluated here. Thanks. Thanks so much, Marcus. And at least, Marian, I really enjoyed the paper and I thought the uh, mixed methods approach was a really useful one. With these kinds of public programs, understanding that context is really important for thinking about the different uh, impacts we see among different subgroups and understanding why that's going on. So I, I think Annalise already uh, reviewed this a little bit, but in particular, the um, finding about paperwork burdens and that the, there's been a reduction in that more recently, I found particularly interesting um, as context for your findings in this program. Since I mostly work in the policy research space, I'm gonna focus my comments in that vein as sort of how you could maximize um, the learning from this for policy. And I think one of the biggest components is thinking about the average benefit of the program versus the margin. And so what you are able to identify with the data that you have right now is thinking about um, for the employers that did apply and were approved, what did they get out of it? That's a really helpful piece of information, but in thinking about expanding the program, we'd want to know more about that marginal applicant. Um, and so you're trying to brainstorm a few ways that you might be able to think through that. It looks like funding is varied a fair amount. Over the different years of the program, in particular um, with the recent pandemic, there's been a, an extra wave of funding um, for ETP. Um, I was also curious if there might be different geographic distributions in terms of um, employers having information networks that um, inform them about the existence of this program and assist with application. And so you might find regional concentrations of areas where employers are more likely to apply. So those are potential avenues to exploit to maybe try and get at some of that, that rich or marginal impact. So we can think about, you know, should California be adding more funding or should this be taken to a larger scale? Um, I also really like the, the motivation, the framing about, um, how employers under invest in training uh, because of the poaching risk. And I was curious to see if you were able to do any sort of calculation as kind of a return on investment to think about, is this something that makes sense for employers to be doing on their own? And if, if it does, then this is where the qualitative study can be really valuable. And, and okay, so why aren't they doing it? Um, there was a, a really interesting model that France used for, for years in the 90s, where instead of subsidizing training, they actually taxed employers if they didn't spend a certain uh, fraction of their payroll uh, on training. And so they, you were able to do a lot of interesting studies there to see the impacts of that employer-provided training. And they actually found reductions in turnover, but that's with a more universal 
adoption of this training behavior. So thinking about that, that broader context setting and also how the uh, return to employers factors in here, what barriers they're facing, I think it are important pieces for pushing the policy uh, a little bit further. The last thing I wanted to touch on, and I know Annalise, you, you mentioned data issues and I agree completely that we definitely need uh, better measures of employer outcomes. Um, so you found uh, large sales impacts among retail, but smaller ones for construction and manufacturing. And I wonder to the extent, how much is that really just an industry specific context, not so much a training specific factor. So are those really the best productivity measures for construction and manufacturing? Is it possible that training in these industries actually makes workers more efficient? And so that's why you're seeing muted impacts on employment. Um, so seeing more about what kinds of other outcome measures are the right employer side measures to think about, are we getting a good return on this training investment, um, I think would be really valuable. And then from the qualitative side, do we have evidence that employers of different sizes are using this program differently in terms of how they target employees for training, who they're choosing, or is it really just down to those internal structures that you mentioned that small firms are just too immature to have these well-developed employee training systems? So further teasing that apart, I think would be really helpful for thinking about the future of this program. Thanks. Joel. Thank you, thank you. Um, read the paper a couple of times actually. It's a great paper, great, great findings. Um, as Marcus said, my background is uh, computer science and most recently artificial intelligence. Uh, I also have a research background. So, so I looked at the paper a little bit from that perspective and I've also been in various conversations regarding automation and AI and the future of work. So, so those are some of the thoughts brewing in the back of my head. The, the way I formed my, my response thoughts were um, kind of three pronged uh, to, to give some idea of what workplace technology trends are like moving forward and, and the ramification of some of those trends, uh, i.e. the future of work and what should, taken from that paper, like what should some of these policies look like uh, going forward, especially as we uh, are in a recession uh, and, and dealing with other, you know, um, uh, events of, of the current time. Um, number one, uh, I, I think it, it behooves me to say that um, that all work companies are, are looking at how to infuse not just automation, but AI into their business functions, right? This, this is like from customer service to, to manufacturer defect detection uh, and even reduction of manual analytics, uh, data analytics wherever possible. Uh, another thing that I thought was important to, uh, to uh, point out, well, what's the difference between automation and AI, right? Well, the, the, the main difference is that, that automation uh, is, is something that is very, um, you, know, you know, robotic and, and akin to replacing rote uh, type of uh, actions and behaviors, right? So, so you could think of, uh, you know, traditional manufacturing line, whereas AI is more dynamic. You know, the nature of AI is setting out patterns. Uh, it's about computers more or less self, self programming, you know, take that, that, that term with a grain of salt. Uh, but it's about dynamic, intelligent decision logic. And, and that is a, that AI part is what's really explo exploding right now. Okay. Where will it have most impact in the workplace? Uh, a Brookings Institution. Um, report pointed this out based off of a, um, a PhD thesis from, I, I want to say Carnegie Mellon, but I, I don't recall the details right now, is that a lot of um, disruption will come to actually white collar jobs, right? So, so we, we've seen um, perhaps, you know, uh, radiologists, uh, um, you know, uh, legal services, uh, clerking, et cetera, et cetera, to have the, the greatest disruption um, there will continue to be disruption, you know, at, at, you know, that traditional blue collar, you know, job, right? If, if we think about what's happening with the pandemic and what's happening with um, even cleaning a hospital, you know, there, there are deployments of robots right now that they go up and down hallways using UV lamps and, and, and disinfectants to, to uh, you know, provide some, some level of safety. So taking all of that 
and, and starting to, you know, marry a little bit more with, with my response to the paper, um, what new skills will be needed? And, and one way I think about this is to think about AI as, as uh, in the workplace as entailing three major roles. And, and that is trainers, uh, explainers, and maintainers, okay? I wish I could have coined that, it's not mine. I got it from some recently, uh, but, but <laughs> it's, it's a very nice way of thinking about that. You know, when we think about trainers, we think about data scientists and engineers, we think about AI experts, you know, practitioners. When we think about explainers, which is really um, something more nuanced, something more contemporary, uh, these are people who can de de interpret AI decisions. Uh, these are AI risk analytics analysts, rather, and even AI auditors. Okay, I, I want to point that out because then it gets into what sort of training might be needed going forward. And then there are uh, AI maintainers, which are akin to maybe your traditional uh, IT maintainers, IT application, you know, engineers, uh, and those can actually largely be be automated. When we think about, well, I, I said that kind of as a matter of fact, I, I think they can largely will be automated going forward. So I kind of say that to say that training and explaining is really where um, a, a lot of new skills I think will be needed. Those skills, of course, being in data science, uh, machine learning. Um, as we go forward though, I, I, I urge us not to think about just those hardcore technical skills, uh, but there will be new skills in human computer interaction that are needed. Uh, you know, how do we coincide with AI in the workplace? Um, uh, that'll also include sociology, psychology, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the ramifications? Uh, of course, there will be some categories that will be eliminated, um, uh, you know, jobs specifically and, and some categories, right? Uh, and, and of course, as we get into, um, from a training point of view, the core jobs, as someone pointed out either in, in this um, session or the previous one, unfortunately, there will be immense, you know, high pay. Well, not unfortunately, high pay is good, right? I, I, I obviously would like to be high, highly compensated for, for my knowledge in, in AI, right? Um, however, uh, that will require immense competition amongst companies for that talent, right? I, I don't have exact figures, but, you know, the, the big four or five tech giants actually account for, I think, uh, over 80% of employment of, of data scientists and, and AI practitioners. Um, of course, that means a lot of people want to work at Google, but what does that mean for other companies that want to harness that talent and obviously need to train those workers to do that sort of thing, okay? So let me fast forward a little bit here. Uh, another ramification though is, is bias, right? So. Uh, you know, when we think about, you know, what's happening with racial injustice now, et cetera, um, uh, you know, biased algorithms are a next wave of how, a, you know, our, our economy, how our, work, our workforce and how uh, consumers on the other side of that workforce or our, our government processes can be affected, right? So that is another part of AI related training that that should not be overlooked, right? Now, how we go forward with this, uh, I'll kind of conclude our remark, my remarks for now. Uh, we are in the middle of a, you know, a pandemic, right? And, and we're in the middle of a recession. And, and um, you know, the nature of AI does require some rigorous training uh, to understand how to apply it safely you know, how to engineer data, how to, how to um, uh, you know, take bias out of the equation. However, um, what we're also looking at is on a global scale, uh, other company, uh, countries such as China, um, um, Russia, uh, et cetera, have uh, already started immense uh, AI-centric uh, development uh, and training on a national scale. Right. And some may argue that the United States is actually already behind. Uh, I would personally argue that it's just my personal opinion. Uh, so it, th that just means that, you know, jumping off of, you know, uh, a program like ETP, we have to look at how we take or institute and execute AI training or support AI training more so at a federal government level. 
It's, it's, I think at this rate, it would be short-sighted to think that um, localities or states alone, you know, just alone, um, can, uh, can properly help um, this country as a whole be, be uh, um, competitive on a global scale going forward with AI. The other thing that we've seen also is that we have only various hotspots in this country. We have, we have Silicon Valley. I happen to live near another hotspot, New York. Uh, um, I think also uh, Austin, Texas. Um, listening to a podcast, I'll throw out Waterloo, Canada, just because I was recently listening to right? friends in Canada, in, in Canada rather. However, you know, we can't continue going for just relying on these hotspots to, to uh, provide training for, for AI competency. Right, it needs to be a more level playing field. So, so that's another thing to think about. Um, the other thing I will say, and then, and then you know, shut up here, is that when it comes to training uh, regarding automation and AI, another thing we should think about isn't just training new workers uh, and training companies on how to take advantage of that. And, and I believe it should be with federal government assistance. But there will be people who are displaced, and there will be people who would be displaced in their um, in their in in late age, right? Let's let's just the numbers, are, you know, let's say the late forties and fifties, and retraining folks for, like that for for AI will be will be a little you know a little more challenging. However, we have to even think about reskilling those people to do other things, right? So so when I think about this in the context of what we saw with the CTP program. It's not just workforce training we should be considering on just that technical skill, but what are the ramifications and the waterfall of training people who are displaced to do other things? And that should be part of a strategic strategy as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joel and Melanie. Um, unfortunately, we're running behind a little bit on time, so I'm gonna uh, encourage uh, any uh, audience members to submit questions um offline to our various either our panelists or uh, our speakers Annalise and Marian um I want to thank them again um Marian and Annalise for an interesting paper and Joel and Melanie for uh interesting uh um discussion of these issues and I want to move along to the next panel so we can be sure that we uh have the full discussion today okay thank you and so for our next panel Unfortunately, uh, it was originally uh, going to be moderated by my colleague Richard Reeves, but uh, he had uh, a little bit of, uh, of an emergency he needed to deal with, so I'll be taking over his duties. Um, and um, we have three distinguished panelists um, to join us here to talk about uh, the effects of COVID in the context of this discussion. Um, we have uh, David Deming, who's a, a professor at Harvard University, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and uh, an expert in this area of uh, automation and reskilling. Um, we have Stephanie Reed Cellini, who's a professor uh, in town um, at uh, uh, George Washington, right? <laughs> and uh, she's also an expert in, in education. And uh, we have uh, our very own uh, Bob Lydon, who's a, uh, a non-resident fellow here at Brookings and also a scholar and a lawyer and uh, an expert on work um, automation and future of work issues. And we're going to have them actually um, discuss, you know, give some observations on what they think is going to emerge out of the, uh, the COVID uh, 19 issue. And so before I'm going to shut up in a second, but I'm going to pose two um, questions to them and I'm going to let each of them actually give their their basic thoughts on that. And then we'll follow up and discuss some of the uh, policy implications. So the first question I'll pose to them is um, thinking about your own research and your own uh, observation of what's been going on in the context of COVID-19. And we're thinking about the recovery from this, if we ever are able to, <laughs> to get to that point, get past this first wave. Um, after COVID-19, uh, what are the challenges you see 
in terms of being able to match skills. Our discussion earlier was uh, was on sort of skills versus credentials. Um, and, um, and so when you're thinking about this, how do we, what challenges do you think we'll face in terms of um, more efficiently matching skills to job needs in light of automation, um, especially after COVID-19, which, you know, one would think would actually push many companies, given that uh, uh, machines don't get sick and people do, uh, towards uh, automation. And on top of that, how do you think COVID-19 has illuminated or altered the landscape in this space in ways that ought to change our policy approaches? Um, I'll let Stephanie begin and then David and then Bob can uh, finish up. And then we'll talk about policy implications. Thanks. Great, thanks so much for having me. Um, so, uh, so I guess I'd address these two questions by thinking um, about retraining. And we kind of know this need for retraining is critically important in mitigating job losses from not only automation, but also this pandemic, um, as we've seen. And I really come at the topic of retraining after having spent the last 15 years or so studying for-profit colleges and this kind of sub-baccalaureate education in the United States. Um, so I will say that I think one of these kind of big challenges we're going to be needing to think about um, is that I think the for-profit colleges, and especially large online for-profit for -profit colleges, um, are seeing this pandemic as an opportunity for growth. Um, and I do worry, I think this brings up some concerns about kind of a growing enrollment in these for-profit colleges with little accountability attached to it. Um, so we've already seen some news reports of kind of increased advertising by for-profits, some optimistic comments by CEOs talking about how students might like to go back to school online. They might like these kind of more established online institutions uh, as they might think of themselves rather than traditional colleges that are, that are newer at online instruction um, moving forward. And when they're thinking about that reskilling, um, those for-profit colleges want to jump in. And we've already seen a few enrollment numbers up for the first quarter of 2020 for some of these large online for-profits. So we also know that in the last recession, for-profits saw enormous growth, their steepest growth. Um, enrollment grew, I think it was about 70% just between 2007 and 2010, um, really hitting a peak there as there was disinvestment in community colleges in particular, um, and not very much uh, regulation at that time either. So of course, um, now we see that many students may be on enrolling online. Um, Pre-pandemic, about 55% of for-profit students were attending completely online compared to just 6% of students in the public sector. So you can see that if COVID is gonna push students online, um, where do we think they might go? Um, so this raises some really important concerns for students, taxpayers, policymakers. Um, I'm particularly concerned that students at these for-profits um, who are disproportionately lower income students and students of color, um, they'll be left with very low earnings and potentially debt that they can't repay coming out of this. So um, just from my own research and, and research by Dave and others in this field, you know, programs in for-profits are about five times more expensive than programs in community colleges for similar certificate type programs. Um, students are more likely to take on debt, take on more debt, more likely to default on their loans in these for-profits. Um, and we know that uh, certificate programs in these applied or vocational programs, um, whether they're online or not in these for-profits have earnings that are much lower than similar programs for similar students in community colleges. Um, my own work suggests that, you know, we're talking about $2,000 less annually um, and that students in these for-profits, even over a lifetime of earnings gains may have trouble repaying their debt in the average certificate program. So we also know that online programs um, don't tend to perform as well as on-campus instruction. Um, we, in the research, we see that it routinely, online instruction, you know, routinely finds lower performance in grades, follow-on coursework, um, those kinds of uh, student outcomes that people have looked at in the online um, sphere there as well. And that's particularly troubling for students with weaker academic backgrounds uh, have more trouble with online learning. So I think that's something we need to look at as we move forward. Um, on top of all this, I will add that it's very hard for students to judge the quality of education they'll get. Um, I think that's a key thing we wanna think about as students look to go back to school and, and reskill and, and find that training provider that's giving them 
the program they'd like to go into in the field they want to get into. Um, we know that the research shows that information posted on a website, like the college scorecard, for example, um, may not be reaching students who don't have a tradition of college going already. Um, it may not be reaching disadvantaged students. Um, so and I'll also mention that uh, I recently um, did some research looking at advertising, and we know that for-profits spend about $400 per student on advertising compared to just $14 um, by public institutions uh, per student. So there's a big gap there in what students are hearing about colleges, what their promises are, what promises they're making, especially in the for-profit college sector. So to just throw out there, you know, I think we need to think a lot about investing in community colleges. We need to think about having accountability metrics in place um, so that, you know, certain providers of low quality education, um, that those providers can't take advantage of students uh, as we move forward. And I think I'll just leave it there for that. I think I've got a lot of ideas out there and I'll let others chime in. All right, Dave. Great, yeah, well, so thank you, Marcus, for having me. Thanks, um, Steph, for, for teeing, teeing me up. And it's just great to be here with you guys today. Um, given um, the topic, I thought I might just talk a little bit, about, I guess, about how we were all thinking about this a few months ago prior to the coronavirus pandemic and then how that changes it. So from my perspective, I think we, we everybody, this is an issue kind of thinking about reskilling the workplace for the 21st century or however you want to say it was an issue when we had three and a half percent unemployment. Uh, and of course, it's an even bigger issue today. And, and I think that just for context, you know, the U.S. spends very little and invests very little relative to other countries in training, meaning, you know, kind of that liminal space in between a formal education and actually like, you know, learning how to do things on the job. So there's this kind of in-between space where in other countries they have these formal apprenticeship programs or, you know, we have a community college system, but it's quite underfunded. Um, Everything is much more federalized in other countries and centrally controlled. So you have workforce boards that get together with industry training councils and figure out, you know, if you're going to be in some skilled trade, what does that entail? Who are you going to work for? What are the terms of the apprenticeship? What is the cost sharing arrangement? And the U.S. is very decentralized and uh, very free market, which, which I think has a lot of benefits in other contexts, but tends to harm us in this context. Because um, if you think about it as a student, what do you want to get out of an education? You only have a few years in which you're paying a very high opportunity cost with, in terms of foregone earnings to go to college. And so you want to make it count. And so you want to get an education that's going to last you for the, the rest of your working life, so 40, 45 years. You need to learn some skills that are future proof, if you will. And, th and those, you know, ideally are quite transferable and quite flexible. Right. And they're not really that applied. Because you might learn the latest techniques in how to be a welder or an electrician or a computer program or anything else, and then technology might change. And, you know, given how hard it is and how weak of a safety net we have, how hard it is to go back and get retrained, you really want to learn all that stuff ideally right away so you don't have to go back to school, so you don't have to leave a job and find another job, et cetera, because our social safety net is so thin for workers who want to go back and get re retooled. On the other hand, if you're an employer, what do you want? You have a job, a very specific set of needs that you need to fill today and you want to pay as little as possible for that worker. You want to support them. It's not that, you know, it's just that you don't want to hire somebody and then, and then spend a lot of money to train them in the type of skills and capacities that they can take anywhere else, right? So you're going to pay for all their training to become a software engineer, and then they're going to go leave for a competitor company, right? And so, so companies want people to have specific skills they need, and workers want to have general skills they can take anywhere. Right. And so there's a real mismatch in, in, in what both sides of the market want and are looking for. And that's exactly where these institutions, this kind of connective tissue comes in in other countries where you sort of meet in the middle and you kind of bargain over this and you figure out, OK, we're going to give you some employment security. We're going to get you retrained if the technology changes. And then you're going to invest in some specific skills that are useful to, to groups of industries or other kind of groups of regional employers or whatever. And this is a kind of hammered out um, in a very centrally controlled way, frankly. It's not the magic of the market. And that's the thing we're really missing here in the US. And that, that, that thing that we're missing has just become more and more urgent as kind of the technology of what you need to do to be a, a valuable employee continues, that the knowledge frontier continues to push outward. And our educational institutions are, are kind of giving us a, sometimes in, in the best case scenario, a very baseline set of skills that are highly transferable, whatever, soft skills, critical thinking, problem solving, however you want to say it. But then the employer looks at that and says, that's great. You know, you're this kind of, ball of clay that I need to mold, but there's very little information about what people can actually do. And so employers end up making these somewhat costly, risky investments in entry-level employees. And during good times, they're happy to do that because some of them turn out to be real gems. 
And then the other ones you can sort of move on from eventually, but right now nobody wants to make that leap. And so I think what we're gonna see in the wake of coronavirus is um, young college graduates and young high school graduates and, and all, all in between are just gonna get hammered because hiring a new employee is a luxury item. And right now what firms are looking for is to fill the kind of bare minimum of what, of what they need to get by. And so I think you saw that happen after the great recession, um, lots of people were harmed um, by the employment impacts of the great recession, but young workers were harmed disproportionately the most. There's some recent research suggesting that they weren't just harmed in terms of earnings, but they were harmed in terms of early mortality and health outcomes as well. And so I'm very worried that's gonna happen again. And I think it's, it's partially happening because we do not have this connective tissue that links the two sides of the market together. So I don't know, I think there's lots of ways for that to happen. Um, it's probably not a federal solution. It's probably a local solution, but the federal government can support it in a variety of ways. And you know, maybe we can talk about it more in the Q&A, but I, I, that's how what I see is the broad problem we face in the US today in terms of workforce training. Well, that, that sounds, that's quite interesting, provocative. Uh, Bob, if you want to step in with your uh, comments. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, and I appreciate being able to uh, follow such two distinguished presentations. Um, so your question, Marcus, is, you know, how has uh, the pandemic changed things? Uh, this is not my insight. It's Richard Haas from the Council of Foreign Relations has pointed out that basically um, the pandemic has accelerated just a ton of pre-existing trends that were already uh, underway, but now um, are sort of a going at warp speed. Example, uh, telemedicine, uh, telework, um, and of course, automation, as you mentioned, robots don't get sick. Uh, people do. So all these things are going to happen and they're going to happen at a very rapid pace. Uh, who knows what's going to happen to big cities as more and more people work remotely and their firms don't want them. And also firms are now redesigning their spaces like crazy so that they're six foot, you know, people six feet apart. The open, the open uh, floor plan where, where I used to work about eight years ago, I used to work at Bloomberg. And if you look at a trading desk in New York or anything like that, you can forget that. All right, uh, you've got all these firms in all over the country that are trying to reconfigure how they're gonna put people um, in these built buildings. And a lot of them can conclude that 50 to 60% of their workforces should never show up. Um, they may show up one day a week, two day a week, but the rest of the time they're at home. So what's that gonna do? That's gonna promote sprawl. You have a lot of you know, uh, satellite centers, maybe um, outside of the uh, downtown or people are working at home. And what's going to happen to all those restaurants that are downtown and all those other little stores that, you know, give New York and other big cities their life? I mean, you're talking about ramifications that um, could not be predicted before the pandemic. And frankly, we can't predict them now. And to me, that is the greatest challenge in trying to retrain people. And I think previous speakers have pointed out that what employers are looking for in this environment is very specific skills. And how are you going to basically transition a lot of people? And this was a big problem before the pandemic, but it's certainly um, an even greater problem now. Um, uh, I have some thoughts very quickly about policy. I know we have very limited amount of time. I'll just throw out a couple of ideas. And Marcus, maybe this is a good transition to a larger discussion. So I've spent decades writing about two ideas that I think the time is now for them. All right. Uh, one is something called wage insurance which uh, would have the federal government compensate you for some portion of your wage loss um, that would be triggered when you get a new job. So if you were making 50,000 before, you get a new job making 30, you lose 20,000 a year, the government would make up, let's say half that, maybe $10,000 a year. And that in effect would compensate the firm for retraining you in a new job. And at the same time, it cushions your, your downfall. We have nothing like this right now. Um, it was endorsed by President Obama in his 2016 State of the Union address in only one sentence. I would like to see it in his national policy. The second and much larger idea is I would like to say uh, lifetime training accounts. Um, uh, I originally proposed these as loans that would be income contingent repayment loans of the kind that you see in colleges. Um, but I got a black, actually a lot of pushback from a lot of liberals saying, why shouldn't this be free or at least substantially free? And I'm just going to throw this on the table. Uh, people try to change their jobs like eight or 10 times a year. They may even do it more. I mean, eight, or, eight or 10 times used to be in the course of their career. They may do it more frequently now because of the pandemic. If we had a system, for example, each person had 100000 bucks in their lifetime training account that they could use to get new certificates as they, change, uh, as they uh, leave jobs and move them, um, and they get them from community colleges, for-profit colleges, et cetera, 
the, this would essentially allow them to accumulate these badges and be able to go back to work. I do think a substantial portion of this ought to be loans and not free because I think people ought to have skin in the game. If you're going to give people things free, um, I think people are not going to take them as seriously as if they had to pay for them themselves. And the final point I will address is something that Stephanie talked about, which is accountability. If we're going to send people back to these schools, whether they're for profit or nonprofit, I think we ought to have federally mandated standards about placement um, success of these programs. So kids, or people, kids or adults ought to know that before they sign up for a program and take on an additional amount in loans and or get some free money, they ought to know that this particular program has a 30% success rate in placing people with the badges in the particular field in which they're getting retraining, or they don't have a success and what kind of salaries are they getting. And I think without this information, then people are going to get defrauded um, and people are going to waste their time and their money. And so I desperately think we need this in addition to financing. And I'll quit there because we have a little time. All right. Thanks for your comments, Bob. So lightning round, um, given our relatively short time, are there any uh, particular uh, policy um, policies, uh, either Stephanie or David, would you like to see enacted to, to, to deal with these issues? I might hop on um, what, what Robert was just suggesting and thinking about accountability for these training programs or uh, community college programs, uh, you know, for-profit programs in particular. And I would make a case for an earnings metric of some type, um, of the type that might be earnings to debt, something like that, or you know, a high school earnings metric, something like that. I think job placement can sometimes be gamed. You know, what does it mean to be placed in the field? Um, but I think a simple to understand. Um, hard to game type of earnings metric or, or accountability metric in some way um, is needed before we're, you know, dumping a lot of money into these, uh, maybe the, even these shorter term programs. I know there's been a lot of talk of short term Pell as well, um, using Pell grants for shorter term um, kind of job training type programs, uh, particularly in public and nonprofit institutions. Um, you know, that's a, a different approach there um, that I'll throw out as a, as a potential uh, policy option, but I think it would need strong accountability with it um, and maybe be limited to public and nonprofits. Um, and then I will also say, um, I think kind of going along this same direction as some of Robert's uh, policy options, I'd say we need to look at income-based repayment of loans uh, and simplify that and make sure that more students are um, using these kind of income-driven repayment plans. Thank you, David. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think, um, Accountability is um, a worthwhile thing to think about. Something we definitely need to take seriously in, in, in a variety of settings and kind of higher education and training more broadly. But I think there's another thing that we, I guess, as economists or as policy wonks tend to neglect, which is actually just direct design. You know, accountability is about imposing incentives and, and, and counting on the market to get it right. And I just don't think this is a case where the market is working very well. I think the real one of the reasons why these programs don't succeed is because they're just not designed to meet the needs of the labor force in real time. And I don't think accountability necessarily fixes that. It sanctions the program that have poor outcomes, but that's highly indirect relative to just getting employers to the table and colleges to the table and potential students to the table and figuring out like what is a set of things that's actually going to work to meet the needs of the regional economy in which we operate, to meet the needs of the global economy if it's something broader. I think that's kind of like hard, hard design work that we tend to be, it, you can't make a rule from the federal government that says do that but you can create the kind of fertile soil in which those types of things happen. And if you look at other countries that do this more successfully, like I wouldn't want to take like the German or the Swiss model of apprenticeships and just say, replace us higher education with that. Cause I think we have a lot of other advantages when it comes to this area that a lot of people call middle skills or kind of job training or more specific things. I think almost all the countries do it better than we do almost all the advanced economies. And so maybe we could learn from them. And if we did like without getting into the details, we we'd see that they're much more intentional about, you know, industry councils, sectoral bargaining, like working out the details. And the government's role is to be a guarantor and to say like, we're going to finance this, this is going to be around, get to the table, figure it out, we'll support it. And I would just like to see more, and as an economist, maybe I shouldn't say this, we, are, we are sort of have this temperament that we wanna like set the incentives right and let the market do its magic. But I just, I don't think it's going to work here. It never has. And um, I continue to have skepticism about it. Well, thanks. Uh, those are interesting ideas and something that we can explore more in future conversations with the Future Middle Class Initiative. Um, 
I want to thank uh, Stephanie, David, and Robert for participating in this panel. I want to thank all of our earlier panelists and presenters and all of the people who uh, showed up to watch. Um, I think this was a very interesting discussion and one that sort of will feed future events um, put on by the Future Middle Class Initiative in this space. Um, thank you again, and uh, until the next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.